हेलो 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 मेरे प्यारे बच्चों भाई हाउ आर यू ऑल वेलकम टू आर सुपर 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 थर्टी वाला बैच एंड हियर वी आर विद यट अनदर चैप्टर ऑफ जियोग्राफी व्हिच इज फॉरेस्ट एंड वाइल्ड लाइफ रिसोर्सेज वी हैव बीन डूइंग अ लॉट ऑफ वर्क वी हैव बीन स्टार्टिंग आवर चैप्टर्स वी हैव बीन प्रैक्टिसिंग क्वेश्चन एंड आई वांट यू ऑल to ensure me that you are following all the lectures right so let's go ahead with another lecture forest and wildlife resources it's a small cute sweet chapter not too much of information to mug up for you and it's a simple 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 chapter right so let us start this chapter forest and wildlife resources a uh, detailed version of this chapter you have read already in class 9 natural vegetation and wildlife and uh, here we are going to introduce what is uh, e ecosystem what uh, type of biodiversity we have in our country and how can we conserve it as i said and i have been continuously saying that we are in class 10th our level of understanding has increased our maturity level has increased now the syllabus is telling you to understand the situation right as i said in nationalism in india so here we have with a chapter summary of uh, natural vegetation and wildlife uh, flora and fauna in india these two terms a lot of kids get confused in these terms sorry forest and wildlife resources i took a wrong name flora means a variety of plants right flora means variety of plants fauna means variety of animals okay so india as we have already read in class 9 that our geography is so interesting it's so uh, different from one corner to the other corner that we have multiple ecosystems running in different area ecosystem is a uh, interconnection between biotic and abiotic resources and when different kind of ecosystems merge together they create a bigger scenario called biome or a bio uh, biosphere we can say we can call it a biome right so india because of its unique different different geography in different corners of the country is quite enriched with different kinds of flora and fauna and is very rich in its bio diversity bio diversity is that in a respective jungle in a respective forest territory what you will find is not just one uh, uniform kind of trees or one type of animal no in a jungle you will find multiple variety multiple varieties of plants multiple varieties of trees of grass of animals of birds right carnivores herbivores everything so we find a biological diversity in the areas right so biodiversity or biological diversity is immensely rich in wildlife and uh, cultivated species diverse in form and functions but closely integrated in a system through multiple networks of interdependence everything is interconnected the biotic factors biotic factors we can say that we have now sorry the abiotic factors we can say we have what kind of temperature we have what kind of uh, rainfall what kind of photo period your area receives uh, what kind of water supply the area has all these factors relate or create a situation for the biotic elements what kind of vegetation will grow in an area like for example if the temperature is high if the temperature is high the rainfall is low the soil is sandy type of so we have a desert type of condition right in this desert type of condition you will not find coniferous trees what you will find are cactus type of plants cactus plant which has adapted its, itself to uh, you know according to the abiotic situations in this area so it creates an ecosystem which is independent and yet interdependent with each other right so india is one of those lucky nations which uh, has been quite rich in its flora and fauna different varieties of plants and animals are seen here but with the due course of time we have found that many of the plant species many of the animal species have fallen into the endangered category endangered is the category where the uh, they are in the animal or the plant is on the brink of extinction it if it uh, reduces in population a little more it may not even exist on the earth so there were many situations which led to that like the british 
were the primary source of destruction of our biodiversity. They destroyed our forest because they wanted commercial uh, activities to be conducted in these areas. They wanted to make sure that the forest grew only a singular type of wood which was commercially useful for them. They also made sure that the forest which uh, were earlier just left alone to be you know to grow now were to be uh, you know, cleaned up and converted into agricultural areas because forests are not useful they are not commercially uh, beneficial whereas agriculture gives you revenue so they were the primary people who uh, actually destroyed a huge chunk of our forest coverage and with the loss of forest coverage we also witnessed a loss of in the fauna variety because that's their habitat that's the place where they live so if the forests were no more then definitely the wildlife also suffered and then intense hunting and poaching also was a result of depletion or you know endangerment of many wildlife let's move on what are the negative factors that cause such fearful depletion of flora and fauna excessive consumption of natural resources for fulfilling human needs such as wood bark leaves rubber medicine dyes food fuel fodder manure etc we become a uh, little greedy and we realize that yes the nature is going to regrow itself so we don't uh, you know hesitate to take something extra from the nature in the name of that we need it it is our useful thing we try it we become greedy and we take extra things from the nature which then eventually uh, results into a negative impact the expansion of railway thanks to british then thanks to the uh, increasing population agriculture again a result of population commercial and scientific forestry mining activities everything is directly indirectly related to the rising population and its rising needs because the number of people are rising we need more food for more food, we need more agricultural areas. For more agricultural areas, we need to cut more forest areas. Uh, population requires more minerals. Hence, we require to do more mining. So, everything is interconnected with the growing population of the country. And yes, poor management. Poor management. We are utilizing the forest. That's something that is unavoidable. But we are not doing as much to reinstate the uh, area or to make sure that we are also growing the forest so that uh, the loss can be compensated okay large scale development projects like dams yeah mining activities these are also hugely destructive for the nature unequal access unequitable consumption of resources and differential sharing of responsibility for environmental well-being unequal access unequal access is that yes we are using uh, the nature no doubt about it but will you say that the people residing in the rural area are utilizing the resources as equal as the people living in the ultra urban areas no we can surely say here that the people in the urban areas because are paying for it they are able to acquire more and more resources they are able to create more damage to the environment while being least connected to the nature Whereas the people living in the rural areas who are closer to the nature are more conservative in nature. They, yes, utilize the resources, but they at the same time also give it back. So, there is an unequal access to resources. Unequitable consumption of resources. Simplest example, water supply. The urban areas, the richest areas uh, never lack in the water supply why because these people are paying for it whereas as you move towards the poorer sections of the society you find that water supply is not adequate water is a basic necessity but yet we find that the access to these resources is not equal the uh, consumption of these resources is not equal a rich person may be using the water to wash his uh, brand a new car or to take a long shower because he was tensed whereas people may be standing in a queue in a village to make sure that they get just one pot of water so there is an uh, inequitable consumption of resources differential sharing of responsibility this can be seen at a global level that whenever it comes to the issues like pollution and population and poverty and you know something or the other the western european nations are always ready 
to throw blame on you you as in people living in poor nations that you are causing the pollution india china the south asian nations you are causing pollution your population is rising you are the reason of the poverty so they are always ready to blame the other person and not take the responsibility themselves they don't realize that they have already gone through their industrial revolution they have already burned their share of coal they have created their share of pollution already and now because they have the time and money and technology to convert everything into green energy now they are sitting on a morally high ground and they are blaming you pointing finger at you ki no india is responsible for the whole pollution india is responsible for the whole population poverty every problem in the world is because of these poor third world nations as they say right and we need to ensure we also have to make sure that we are taking care of this nature collectively which we do not do very few very very few people are actually uh, uh they have the right intention to conserve the nature most of most of the people are only there to click a selfie post it and get all the fame right actual work is done by very very few people right now how can we conserve how what is uh, the part of the government which is doing the conservation work are we aware that we require to conserve the forest are we doing something yes we are doing something we woke up a little late but we are doing things so conservation uh, preserves the ecological diversity and preserves the genetic diversity of plants and animals and our government has been active into doing it so uh, the first and very important point here is the creation of indian wildlife protection act which was implemented in 1972 now this may seem like a little late right we got independence in 1947 but we thought about the forest in 1972 yes because earlier we had other issues to look at they were at priority we had a huge population to feed we had poverty to get rid of we needed to make sure that our people are getting educated are getting employed are getting the basic food by 1960s i'd say late 1960s we were in a we came into a little stable situation and by that time due to excessive exploitation of forest and wildlife the forests are becoming quite quiet we could not hear the tigers we could not hear the lions we could not hear the elephants why because the government had been negligent on that side so the hunters the poachers everybody who wanted to exploit the forest were doing it freely so by 1972 because of the efforts of the ngos and the people who actually cared about conservation of the forest they took notice that the forests are quiet we don't hear the animals where are they so we realize that they are getting lesser and lesser in number by day and we need to make sure that they don't go extinct because this will disturb the whole food chain this will disturb the whole ecological balance so we initiated this indian wildlife protection act in 1972 for protecting habitats and, uh, and an all india list of protected species was published published so a list of animals was uh, presented that we are going to protect these 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 animals primarily to start with and then as we move on we are going to extend the list include more and more animals so that was the first and foremost step into protecting the forest the center and the state government also took responsibility to make sure that uh, the part which is under their territory under their jurisdiction is also given protection what kind of protection the states created wildlife sanctuaries and central government created national parks
now remember this is where we are conserving the forest and forest if a forest is there in madhya pradesh it would also be in india so the wildlife sanctuaries and national parks uh, a lot of times they overlap their territory because the state takes the first step to ensure that this area is protected and the center takes the second step into uh, making sure that it also gets a central protection right so center and many state governments have established national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and several projects for protecting specific animals the tiger the one horned rhinoceros the kashmir stag or hangul three types of crocodile freshwater crocodile saltwater crocodile and the gharial the asiatic lion and others most recently the indian elephant black buck the great indian bustard and the snow leopard etc have been given full or partial legal protection against hunting and trading through india right so the uh, state governments are becoming more aware and are making sure that they are also taking a step into protecting the wildlife and the flora in their areas there is one word called poaching which is used here and students usually get a, a lot of confusion that ma'am what is the difference between hunting and poaching hunting is usually done by uh, animals to kill and consume their food hunting is done for uh, food gathering right so a lot of tribals do hunting uh, animals definitely the carnivores they do hunting and hunting is done to just you know uh, fill your tummy to make sure that you get your food but by the time the british came in india it kind of became a trend and even after that the animal parts became a very hot asset in the illegal markets in the black markets the like the skin of a uh, tiger nails and no the tusk of elephant these body parts they were sold as a sign of their luxury as a sign of you know uh, something unique that they possess or as even medicinal products the animal parts were now sold in the market so if somebody is killing a tiger for not consuming for taking his skin because that's well valuable will this person stop at just killing one animal no this person is going to go on and on as long as he is free and find it very easy to kill a tiger right so poaching is when you are hunting for commercial purposes when you are hunting to sell the animal and animal products and make money out of it this makes it very very illegal right so these animals which are given protection by the government here it is Ill illegal in our country to kill or hunt these animal poaching becomes something even more severe to add to this uh okay the central government also announced several projects for protecting specific animals under the wildlife act of 1980 and 86 several hundred butterflies moths beetles and one dragonfly have been added to the list of protected species in 1991 for the first time plants were also added to the list starting with six species so as i said that as we moved on from 1972 that was the first step indian wildlife protection act we started expanding the list and we started adding more and more species which we thought would require protection from the government so that we could you know stop them from getting endangered or getting extinct from the surface of the earth so even the smallest of the small animals insects are added to it right one interesting project which i'm sure everybody has heard about is the project tiger one of the well publicized wildlife campaigns in the world is project tiger it was launched an year after the indian wildlife protection act that is 1973 right there are around 39 tiger reserves in india covering an area of uh, 32137.14 square 
kilometers and this specifically aimed to protect the national animal of our country surprisingly this animal known as the national animal of our country was on the brink of endangerment and thanks to the government efforts we were able to uh, pull the population up again although it's not still as much as uh, it used to be but we are able to make improvements make you know positive changes in that area so this is another important project to mention when you write your exam and to uh, you know add to that we have what have we done so far we have created the indian wildlife protection act we have uh, seen the state government and the central government create wildlife sanctuaries and national parks we have seen the introduction of project tiger and an extension of the list of species including insects and plants right now we needed to make sure that the forest the habitats of these animals is also protected now if you remember in class 9th uh, the name of the chapter was uh, forest society and colonialism if i am right the name of the chapter history chapter was forest society and colonialism we read about forest uh, reservation where the british reserved certain areas of the forest and made sure that they utilized that reserved forest for only and only commercial purposes now this was entirely different here we see that the government realized that we need to protect the habitat the living place of these animals so what we have to do here is we need to make sure and uh, maintain the uh, density of the forest the natural area where they are residing and so we divided the forest into three areas we have reserved forest we have protected forest and the third category is unclassed forest more than 50% coverage of the forest that we have in india is identified as reserved forest reserved means it cannot be touched or harmed neither the forest nor the fauna right you cannot damage the forest area you cannot damage the animals which are residing in these forest area and they get exclusive protection from the government uh, states like madhya pradesh states like kashmir states uh, like maharashtra where there is you uh, know a dense area covered with forest they are a lot they are the major parts where reserved forest can be seen a second category which covers almost like one third we can say of the uh, forest area they have also been given protection called the protected forest of course but they can be accessed with permissions right they can be accessed with permission but not for exploitation they can be accessed with permission only to uh, only by the locals the tribals the rural people who are residing on the edges or margins or uh, the tourist right they also get a good amount of protection and the third category is unclassed forest as it says the unclassed forest is the forest which is uh you know can be used for commercial purposes it can be owned by an individual it can, could be owned by a government it could be just a waste land so these are the areas which are uh, open for commercial exploitation so we do have not categorized it we call it a unclassed forest right so three categories of forest have been created in the areas where the forest density is highest to ensure to make sure that uh, not just the fauna but the flora the vegetation also gets its protection so these were the steps so far that we have read which were initiated by the government which are legal steps and uh, if you break this then definitely there are going to be consequences but 
anything which is created by the government is a part of the law or is imposed on us may not be that effective but if the community if the society willingly comes out and says no this is our forest we need to protect this forest because it is our duty then it becomes even more effective so we see that how community in our country because we have always been a nature loving nation our festivals our you know entire livelihood has been just around the forest so we have uh, even as a community also contributed into protecting the forest let's look at uh, community and conservation the first and in fact i'd say a very interesting perspective which is given here is the sacred groves sacred is a place which is very pious a place where we believe is uh, you know our gods and goddesses reside there and something which should not be uh, disturbed or harmed right so many of the tribals living in our country have identified huge parts of their forest and identified uh, called uh, identified them called them as sacred groves pavitra jungle they are calling it and they believe really they believe that this forest is the place where our gods and goddesses reside and it uh, should not be damaged or harmed so it gives the identification of sacred groves to a territory it automatically gives it protection because people are uh, so religiously devoted to their duty of protecting the forest that they can never never harm the area so sacred groves or the forest of gods and goddesses are patches of forest or parts of large forest which have been left untouched by the local people and any interference with them is banned because they are believed to be uh, pious they are believed to be sacred places for their gods and goddesses the mundas the santhals of chhota nagpur region this uh, can be asked in the exam it is uh, you know although it's given in a box but still questions are asked from this part the mundas and the santhals of chhota nagpur region worship mahua and kadamb trees and the tribals of odisha and bihar worship the tamarind and mango trees during weddings to uh, many of us people and banyan trees are considered sacred mango leaves so even in uh, during i think fest, uh, the diwali time we hang it at our doors even if you are going uh, for any puja or any havans mango leaves are used and major items which are used in a puja is you know they come from the nature so identifying parts of forest as sacred gives them automatic protection and it also enhances the faith of the people so uh, we are doing two things at the same time and getting all the benefits so first community and conservation part is identification of forest as the sacred groves then we have many other examples like the bishnoi villages in rajasthan they are very very devoted uh, vegetarians and protectors of the black buck the chinkara nilgai and peacock few animals which are seen in these uh, areas ni uh, jo, the buck buck the black buck especially kala hiran right it can be seen as an integral part of the community and nobody harms them sariska tiger reserve which is in rajasthan villagers have fought against mining by citing wildlife protection act there was mining dolomite mining going on close by which was damaging the forest which uh, in turn was you know disturbing the lives of the the animals there so the people came out and protested against the mining activity and they made sure that the mining activity was stopped right so the community it does not here require any law or somebody to push them that go and go protest against this they are doing it willingly they are doing it on their own why because they believe that the forests are an important part of their life so like the bishnoi community protecting the uh, chinkara and sariska tiger reserve protected by the locals okay 
Now, the inhabitants of five villages of Alwar district of Rajasthan have declared 1200 hectares of forest as the Bhairodev Dakav Sanchuri. Bhairodev Dakav Sanchuri. Okay, so uh, the Bhairodev Dakav Sanchuri, the word may sound very funny to us, right? Because these are people, local people, they could not, uh, you know, take the word sanctuary. They don't know what is the actual spelling or, you know, what is the purpose. But they know that sanctuary means that uh, area which is protected. So, they have given it their own name. The Bhairo Dev Dakav Sanctuary, 1200 hectares of forest has been declared as the Bhairo Dev Dakav Sanctuary. Sanctuary villages came up with their own set of rules and regulations which do not allow hunting. They are also protecting the wildlife against any outside encroachment. So, here the government does not need a piece of paper. The government does not require to implement or impose a law. The people are doing it on their own. That's how much our communities are connected with the nature. One uh, famous name which I am sure you have heard was the Chipko movement. It was initiated in the Himalayan region and the leader was Sundarlal Bahugunaji. The reason was that uh, people had come to commerce to clean the area of the forest and commercially exploit the zone. The villagers, especially women, they came out and they said no. We are not going to allow you to destroy our forest because this is our home. They came out, they started hugging the uh, trees, making sure that those who have come to cut the trees are not getting any access to the tree trunks to cut, right? So, the Chipko movement started by Sundaral Bahugana in the Himalayan region was also uh, an, a joint effort of the community and they not just protected the forest they also made sure that the forest is uh, recreated there was a system of afforestation the forest is not destroyed entirely the villages the rural areas especially the areas which are connected to the uh, forest areas closely they know that they are using the forest Right? It's not like they don't uh, use the forest at all. They are dependent on the forest. But they also make sure that they uh, regrow the forest. They make up for the, for the loss that they are making to the forest. So, afforestation is also an important part of their livelihood. Interesting ones, the Beej Bachao Andolan and the Navadanya Andolan. Beej Bachao Andolan, save the seeds movement this was an interesting one this said that uh, you know after the introduction of the hyv seeds after the introduction of the foreign seeds in the indian uh, agricultural market a lot of our traditional seeds were not being used and the basic fact the basic scientific fact says that whatever grows in your area naturally is more nutritious for you, more useful for you, more easily digested by you in comparison to something which has been brought from outside or something alien. So, Beej Bachao Andolan was a project which was to conserve the original uh, breeds, original seeds in their original form without any kind of uh, artificial addition to them. So, we could make sure that the seeds, the original seeds sustains and we could use it and we could produce better organic crops. Navadanya Andolan. Nav is nine. Danya is dana or seed. Traditionally, in the tribal areas, you don't see monoculture. You don't see a single crop being grown in a large area. You find that they mix up the crop. In many areas, especially if you go to the territories like uh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha belt, nine crops, Navadanya, can be seen growing in the forest areas because they help each other out. They do not destroy the soil. They also are useful for our nutrition requirement. So, collectively, 
we have been doing this for such a long time culturally it had been a part of our system but due to the modernization due to the impact of western culture we have started to forget those so to bring those back the original seeds beej bachao the use of more than one grain in your food navdanya were the projects that uh, have shown the at adequate levels of diversified diversified crop production without the use of synthetic chemicals is possible and also economically viable it's economically viable why because now you won't have to add extra something artificially to the soil the crops help each other the crops help each other and lastly we have the joint forest management which is a, a real time inclusion of society along with the government so if a government comes into an area and tells you okay this forest is protected you cannot enter it it may create problem for the locals it may create problem for the locals because locals are directly indirectly uh, you know they are connected to the forest they also require the forest but in uh, instead of making a law a rigid law if you ask the people to join hands and create a joint forest management where yes the laws are created but the responsibility to uh, see through the law is given to the local communities to make sure that nobody enters in the forest and exploits the forest nobody encroaches the territory nobody goes in for hunting or poaching then the responsibility is shared and it works in a better way if you are going to just create a wall okay this is part of the forest is not accessible to you now the people may find ways to you know get their resources in one way or the other but if you allow them some access and then ask for a uh, responsibility to ensure that the forests are conserved at the same time this helps us in the growth of the forest this helps us in the conservation of the forest so not just making laws indian government has been quite active in making sure that we uh, are able to bring the forest diversity that we had the fauna diversity that we had although we are still a long way behind the percentage of forest in a country should be 33% how much we have 23% we are still lacking uh, 10% of the forest which should be there to maintain the ecological balance but we are working towards it right we are working towards it so with all these uh conditions and hopeful our participation we are we will be able to conserve the forest let's move on to the boards and start with our multiple choice questions okay select the right statement regarding biodiversity biodiversity is maximum in forests right it refers to only flora of a particular area no it is related to various species of flora and fauna of a particular area yes it represents the total number of individuals of particular species living in an area no so option a is right and option c is right a and c are right okay which state or states has uh, the highest reserved forest ratio kerala west bengal jammu and kashmir maharashtra if we have to take just one name then i think mp has the highest uh, area percentage of uh, forest under its reserved uh, forest category if we have to go through and choose the correct answer of highest reserved forest all of these areas have very high forest reserve reserved areas in their territories so all will be the answer okay read the statement and select the correct answer expansion of railways plantation agriculture commercial and scientific forestry and mining activities were largely responsible for the depletion of forest and wildlife during colonial period correct unequal access unequitable con and consumption of resources and differential sharing of responsibility for environmental well being are the cause for the depletion of biodiversity correct both the statements are correct but they don't explain each other 
right both the statements are correct but they don't explain each other option d becomes our answer these quite kind of questions assertion and reason statement verification will be asked to just make sure that you have questions like this right the chipko movement in the himalayas to protect the forest cover was led by or started by s l bahugana dr anil agarwal dr aruna roy medha patkar the answer is option a sundar lal bahugana ji s l bahugana the indian wildlife protection act was implemented in which year important year you should all remember 1972 in a year after project tiger was launched so 1972 indian wildlife protection act 73 project tiger <clears throat> match the following okay reserved protected and unclassed forest reserved forest forests are regarded as most valuable and as far as the conservation of forest and wildlife resources a2 protected forest are lands protected from any further depletion agreed unclassed other forest and wasteland belonging to both government and private individuals and communities a2 b3 c1 option a is our answer very short answer questions what are endangered species endangered species are those species which have reduced in population due to human activities or through natural uh, system to such a extent that if the number reduces any further they may extinct from the they may go extinct from the world right on they are on the brink da uh, danger of extinction name any two farmers or citizens groups which have shown that adequate levels of diversified crop production without use of synthetic chemicals are possible and economically viable two projects uh, have been discussed beej bachao andolan and navadhanya andolan when was project tiger launched just told you the answer 1973 name the place of state where people have fought against mining by citing the wildlife protection act they took uh, the wildlife protection act and they used it to make sure that uh, the tiger reserve is protected it was sariska tiger reserve in rajasthan what is jfm this is joint forest management it was a movement launched to manage and restore degraded forests by involving the local communities so it was a government and community uh, act in a joint manner name the state which was first to pass the joint forest management resolution it was odisha okay short answer type question let me fill my glass of water then we'll move further okay what is <coughs> biodiversity this has come in uh, 2012 biodiversity is the sum total of all the varieties of species of plants and animals and microorganisms living on the earth so two terms are collectively used here bio is uh, anything which is living diversity is in diverse forms in diverse species right some spe scientists estimate that more than 10 million species live on our earth and some believe that this number can be more than 100 million right why because the earth is so big it is so diverse it is so uh, complex that we human being with all our technology still have not been able to access every part of it so we are uncertain of the number the uncertain of the diversity that we may find on the earth why is it necessary to increase the area of forest in india forest definitely play a key role in the ecological system as these are the primary producers on which all other living beings depend many forest dependent communities directly depend on them for food drinks medicines culture spiritual uh, activities 
forest provide us timber forests are also uh, they also provide bamboo wood for fuel grass charcoal fruits plants etc i'm sure you can this was a simple question you can write the answer okay developed countries and rich people are considered the major factor for environmental degradation explain this is a high order thinking question right so don't stray your mind okay this is high order thinking these are hot okay so uh, why are we saying that rich people and developed countries are majorly responsible for environmental degradation developed countries consume more resources than underdeveloped countries or developing countries for example an average american consumes 40 times more resources than an average somalian which is a very poor country the rich class probably causes more ecological damage than the poor class they use everything which comes in a plastic packaging whereas poor people don't so you can see how much plastic they are adding to the nature it's just one simple thing that we see around because energy consumption level of the rich is high as uh, is very high in compared to uh, comparison to the poor rich people use non renewable resources on a large scale right with reference to the type and distribution of forest answer the following uh how are the uh, how are the forest classified how are they classified we divide them into three categories reserved which are exclusively protected protected which have been protected and uh, stopped from going for in any more level of degradation permissions are given to enter in the forest but not destroy the forest unclassed which is owned by individuals or government and can be used for commercial purposes which type of forests are regarded most valuable as far as the conservation of forest and wildlife resources are concerned it is reserved forest what was the chipko movement what is jfm and what was its its objective the movement was launched in the himalayas against deforestation the chipko movement the leader of the movement was sundarlal bahugana ji in this movement people from the forest they came out hugged the trees uh, to make sure that those who have cut come to cut the forest and use it for commercial purposes could not do it and it was a very successful movement joint forest management is when the communities and the governments come together for the purpose of conservation of forest and uh, uh, it is a program which involved local communities in the management and restoration of degraded forest right long answer type questions this is a small chapter so the even uh, not a lot of questions are asked from this chapter last year's paper i saw there was no question from this chapter nature worship is an old age belief explain how has it helped in conservation of forest and wildlife in india and in many of the uh, parts of the world especially in asia you will see that nature worship is a very very old tradition because the modern gods and goddesses they uh, they evolved with the modern time earlier when uh, people did not have any uh, you know sense of religion and everything they what they feared was whatever was around them so they feared the powers of the nature and that's who they worship so nature worship is an age old tribal belief based on the premise that all creations of nature have to be protected such beliefs have preserved several virgin forest in pristine form called the sacred groves these patches of forest or parts of large forest have been left untouched by local people and any interference with them is banned the mundas we then uh, come up with examples the mundas and santals of chota nagpur plateau this we have read in the previous part people and banyan trees are considered sacred not just by the tribals but in the uh, mainstream communities as well sacred qualities are often ascribed to springs mountain peaks plants animals which are closely protected like uh, in rajasthan the bishnoi community protects the uh, kala hiran the black buck 
नील गाय पीकॉक दीज एनिमल्स दे कम अंडर देयर प्रोटेक्शन इफ यू गो टू दिस विलेज वेयर द बिश्नो इज प्रोटेक्ट दीज एनिमल्स यू विल फाइंड दैट दीज एनिमल्स दे रोम क्वाइट फ्रीली इन द विलेज एंड दे आर नॉट बॉर्डर्ड बाय द प्रेजेंस ऑफ ह्यूमन बीइंग्स दे फील सो एट होम with the presence of this community who are so you know into protection into making sure that these animals are uh, conserved in their natural habitat without any kind of destruction okay why is conservation of forest and wildlife necessary in what way have conservation projects changed the recent changed in the recent year we need to uh, ensure that the forest but we first have to start with why the forests are necessary forests are definitely necessary for life they provide us with oxygen you know the basic answers that you have you can right and then if you extend the answer you can add that if we destroy the forest it leads to a loss of cultural diversity cultural diversity how many tribals they live in the forest areas if forests are destroyed then it means that these tribes will be forced to come out these will be forced to live in the mainstream society change their way of living and a complete entire culture including their clothing their language their uh, food everything will be wiped out so if we destroy the forest areas we definitely destroy a huge cultural uh history that we have residing in these forest for example uh okay many of the tribal communities like muria gonds dhurwas batras etc have lost their habitat because of the destruction of forests complex web of living organism the forest are uh, filled with so much of biodiversity and they are all interconnected with each other if one animal or one type of plant is destroyed or a part of the forest is destroyed it not just affects this part of the forest or just the flora it affects the other flora and the fauna part of the forest as well so everything is connected for example the plants and animals and microorganisms recreate the quality of the air we breathe the water we drink and the soil that produces our food without which they cannot we cannot survive large scale destruction of forest is seen for large scale projects like making a dam or you know uh, creating a mining site which has uh, been a loss for us distinguish between reserved forest protected forest and unclassed forest uh, more than 50% of the total forest land is declared as a reserved forest identified as reserved or permanent forest which cannot be harmed in any way almost one third of the total forest area of india is called the protected forest these are protected from any further depletion and uh, these consist of only 16% of the total forest called the unclassed forest and owned by the individuals or government and can be used for commercial purposes okay reserved exclusively controlled by the government protected again controlled by the government this can be public or private then we have the na name of the states where we find these forest okay so this we have then we have case study based question i am going to read a paragraph and then we are going to have some questions related to that paragraph okay okay the indian wildlife protection act was implemented in 1972 with various provisions for protecting habitats an all india list of protected species was also published the thrust of the program was towards protecting the remaining population of certain endangered species by banning hunting uh, giving legal protection to their habitats and re, uh, restricting trade in wildlife project tiger one of the well publicized wildlife campaigns in the world was launched in 1973 tiger conservation has been viewed not only as an effort to save an endangered species but with equal importance as a means of preserving biotypes of sizable magnitude corbett national park in uttarakhand sundarban national park in west bengal bandhavgarh national park in madhya pradesh sariska wildlife sanctuary in rajasthan manas tiger reserve 
in Assam and Periyar Tiger Reserve in Kerala are some of the tiger reserves of India. When was the Indian Wildlife Protection Act enacted? 1972. Which provision were introduced other than the Indian Wildlife Protection Act to protect flora and fauna? National parks, forest reservations, wildlife sanctuaries, all of the above. It is all of the above. Sabhi the. The Sundarban National Park is known for, the Sundarban National Park is famous for Nilgai, Asiatic Lions, Royal Bengal Tigers or Blue Sheep. It's most famous for its Royal Bengal Tiger. They are grand, grand animals. Right, so that brings us to the end of our today's class and let's make sure that we study well, we revise our syllabus, we go through the questions and we watch RPW Super 30 Wala lecture and strive for being super, right? So, thank you so much, Bacho. Bye-bye. Have a great, great day.